Hello, my name is Panna Codner and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery, Division of Trauma Critical Care at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Today I'll be presenting a lecture on field amputation. We'll cover several objectives in today's lecture. First, we'll discuss the background of field amputations and the necessity for a protocol-based system. Next, we'll review the organization and hierarchy of the incident command structure. Third, we'll review the indications for initiating a field amputation and its clinical applications. At the conclusion of this lecture, you will be able to outline the steps and feel comfortable in performing a field amputation simulation. In addition, we'll review the common pitfalls you may encounter when performing this procedure. The idea of creating a protocol for field amputation is not a new one. In 1979, suggestions were made to establish amputation teams and protocols in major metropolitan areas. But still today, the existence of such teams remains the exception. There is limited evidence-based data in the literature looking at this subject. A cross-sectional epidemiological survey of emergency medical service directors from 200 of the largest metropolitan areas in the U.S looked at available training and demonstrated that in a five-year period, 26 in-field extremity amputations were performed. 53% were done by trauma surgeons and 36% by emergency medicine physicians. The overwhelming majority, 96%, stated no training was available to them, and only two EMS systems had a protocol in place. This study emphasizes the need for an established protocol especially for such a high-risk yet uncommon event. This quote was in response to the previous study I mentioned, and I believe it is very appropriate. The true need for field amputation should be an emergent one, with emergent meaning now or never. Other than in this setting, the procedure should be somewhat non-existent. The incident command structure is part of the National Incident Management System, or NIMS. It is a standardized, on-scene, all-hazards incident management approach that emphasizes the chain of command and unity of command. The chain of command refers to the orderly line of authority within the ranks of the incident management organization. The unity of command means that all individuals have a designated supervisor to whom they report at the scene of the incident. Upon arrival to the scene, you should report to the incident command post. Most likely, you will report to the incident commander, thereby following the unity of command. You may be asked to report directly to someone else, for example, the operations section chief. Whoever you are ultimately told to report to, all decisions must go through that person. If you want a helicopter, if you want to transport a patient, if you want to leave the scene, if you are asked to speak to the media, etc., all of those decisions must go up the chain of command. Don't make those decisions yourself. Of utmost priority when called to the scene of a potential field amputation is safety. Safety refers to the safety of patients and rescuers. Safety involves knowing the cause of entrapment and potential hazards surrounding the scene, such as hazardous material like gas leaks, further structural collapse, or extremes of temperature. In addition, in this day and age, consideration for terrorism has to be a priority. Explosives need to be considered at every scene. Secondary explosives are those designed to specifically injure rescue workers. These devices are set off only after rescuers have entered the scene. Field environment safety is unfamiliar and outside of the expertise of most physicians. There are specialized team members who are trained in field environment safety. The Heavy Urban Rescue Team, or HURT, stabilizes the scene and gains access to the patient. The HURT team also monitors the atmosphere for oxygen levels and other potentially explosive gases. HAZMAT is also another team specialized in field environment safety. It will be necessary that field medical providers practice scene safety with HURT and HAZMAT members. In this way, we can learn about critical aspects of the confined space environment and realize the potential physical demands of the rescue. The police are also an important component of safety. Part of their goals include crowd control, securing a crime scene, and preservation of forensic data. The primary principle of field amputation is that of life over limb. 
This will be discussed further later on. The need for field amputation usually arises when a person, and especially an extremity, is entrapped. The majority of field amputations occur as a result of entrapment by motor vehicle crashes. Industrial and farming accidents, such as having an extremity trapped in an auger or piece of equipment, may also necessitate a field amputation. Structural collapse is also another potential indication for field amputation. There are four main indications for field amputation. The first two are relatively straightforward, and the second two are dependent on provider judgment. The first indication involves an entrapped extremity where extrication will not occur rapidly. The patient is hemodynamically abnormal, hypotensive, and is a non-responder to initial IV fluids. A trauma patient is described according to ATLS as a responder or non-responder. The former is a patient who is hypotensive and or tachycardic who responds to a 2 liter fluid challenge. With this initial fluid, their hemodynamics return to normal. A transient responder is one who initially responds to the 2 liter fluid challenge but then becomes hypotensive and or tachycardic requiring colloid administration, usually blood, and potentially surgical intervention to stop the bleeding. Finally, the non-responder's vital signs remain abnormal despite the administration of 2 liters of crystalloid and blood products. These patients need their bleeding controlled immediately. This first scenario illustrates the life over limb model. The second indication again involves an entrapped extremity with extrication not occurring rapidly. In this situation, field amputation is necessary where further structural collapse or bodily injury is imminent if the patient is not rapidly extricated. As we discussed earlier, the first two indications for a field amputation are relatively straightforward. The third and fourth indication are more dependent on field provider judgment. The third indication involves an entrapped extremity with prolonged extrication, but the patient is a responder to IV fluids. This scenario involves careful thought and discussion with all team members, medical and non-medical. The final scenario involves an entrapped extremity in a hemodynamically normal patient, and extrication is likely to take many hours if it can be done at all. Let's review the contents in the field amputation kit. In the kit, we have anesthetics, paralytics, analgesics, and sedatives, two tourniquets, sterile gloves, gown, mask, and goggles, ABD pads and gauze, laparotomy pads, saline, six inch ACE wraps, plastic bags, scalpel, Mayo scissors, Kelly clamps, hemostats, both small and large, sterile towels, betadine solution, handheld battery operated sagittal saw with spare blades and backup battery, and a giggly saw. This is a picture of a handheld battery operated bone saw by Stryker. In our training video, which you will see shortly, we use a Stryker bone saw. This bone saw works very much like a cast saw. This is a picture of a giggly saw. This is in the field amputation kit as a backup in case the battery powered saw doesn't work. This saw is more challenging because both hands are needed for operation, leaving no hands free for retraction of the soft tissues. In talking about field amputation, the principles of advanced trauma life support are a priority. The goals of the ATLS system are several fold. The first is to assess the patient's condition rapidly and accurately. Next is to resuscitate and stabilize according to priority, which will be discussed on the next slide. Next is to arrange appropriately for hospital transport. And finally, to ensure that optimal care is provided and that the level of care does not deteriorate at any point during the evaluation, resuscitation, or transport processes. ATLS consists of easily remembered priorities in a primary and secondary survey. In most, if not all situations, the secondary survey will be conducted when the patient is in a hospital set setting. Even in the primary survey, which is listed here, not all of the components may be completed. The primary survey focuses on the A, B, C, D, and E's 
that quickly assess and treat life-threatening conditions in the trauma patient. A is for airway. This is assessed by asking the patient his or her name. Proper phonation ensures an intact airway. B is for breathing. The chest wall should be inspected, auscultated, and palpated if possible. An example of a B problem is a tension pneumothorax. C is for circulation. The pulse rate, quality, and character of the pulse rate are important in assessing C. D is for disability. Calculation of the Glasgow Coma Score and a cursory neuromotor exam, especially of the injured extremity if possible, should be performed. E is for exposure and may not be possible. The word disaster is derived from Latin for evil and star. Predicting future disasters is unpredictable, but learning from previous disasters is invaluable. Disaster management and emergency preparedness also talks about pitfalls in the following areas communications, supplies, security, and volunteers. We will examine each of these a bit further now. The communications pitfall refers to and anticipates that the telecommunications systems over land and mobile will be overwhelmed. Therefore, redundancy with respect to equipment and mode must be planned. Both vertical and horizontal communications should be ensured. The second pitfall involves supplies that may be needed. Supplies must be kept in a safe and secure location. Also remember to store supplies in a high and dry place. Security applies to providers, patients, supplies, and systems such as communication and transport. Volunteers are always well-meaning and in no short supply, but they can pose a danger to others and to themselves. Volunteers must be properly trained and credentialed. Volunteers are an important part of a properly planned and organized disaster response system. Now we will talk about the actual procedure of a field amputation. The first priority is to determine the necessity for performing a field amputation based on the indications presented earlier. Next, the setup is arranged. That is, the field amputation kit is opened. The patient should receive pain and sedative medication as appropriate. Next, the patient is prepared for the procedure. For example, clothing may need to be removed. A tourniquet is applied above the operative field, but not over a joint. Sterilization of the field is accomplished by pouring betadine solution over the limb of interest. Sterile towels are next placed around the amputation site. Using a scalpel, divide the soft tissues as far circumferentially around the lowest point on the injured extremity. Using a surgical clamp, bluntly dissect soft tissue inferior to the bone of interest. Next, using a surgical clamp, pull a laparotomy pad through and under the bone. Grab the two tails of the laparotomy pad and pull firmly towards the patient's head. Test the battery-operated sagittal saw and release the safety on the saw. Transect the bone perpendicular to its long axis. After transecting the bone, replace the safety on the saw and set it aside. Apply saline moistened sterile dressings over the amputation site. Place a 6-inch ACE bandage over the wound and around the extremity. Finally, if possible, retrieve the amputated limb and also apply saline moistened, sterile dressings and an ACE bandage. Transport the limb in a clean plastic bag with the patient. In conclusion, the need for a field amputation is an uncommon event. The rarity of the situation makes having a protocol in place essential. In this way, the indications and procedure can be clearly outlined. Finally, we have outlined a protocol in our curriculum for field amputation training that can be learned and reinforced through real-time education. Thank you for your time.